The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to the webinar with Mike Myatt, the author of the new book, Hacking Leadership. I am so thrilled to, to introduce Mike today. I've known Mike in the leadership blogging world for many years. In fact, I think he may be the first leadership blogger ever. I don't know. Maybe, Mike, you could fill us in on that a bit later. Uh, Mike is a leadership advisor to Fortune 500 CEOs and their board of directors, and he's widely regarded as America's top CEO coach. His new book, uh, Hacking Leadership, will be available on December 16th and is now available for pre-order. And we're so excited because uh, we're going to do this webinar a bit differently than most in that we're going to just have some time to talk with Mike. So I want to invite everyone to feel free to put questions into our question panel. And throughout the event, I'll be asking your questions and having a conversation with Mike. You can ask Mike just about anything. He said he can take hard questions. Um, so nothing is off the table. We're just going to be friendly and learn a lot and have a good time. Um, and I'm going to start Mike off with a question from me. Uh, Mike, I was wondering if you could share with us what motivated you to write the latest book. Ah, boy, you're going to start with a tough one, are you? Uh, yes, sir. Well, first of all, before I answer that question, Becky, I just wanted to uh, Thank everybody for taking time to join us today. I know that uh, everybody's busy and carving an hour out of a, of a work day is not something that's done lightly. So I just wanted to start out by thanking everybody for joining us. Uh, back, back to the question, I, I, you know, I told myself I was actually never going to write another book. In fact, I tried hard to wiggle out of this, but I, I had... I had a literary agent that was very aggressive and, and pushing me hard, and I had a lot of things that, uh, frankly, I've been wanting to say for quite some time because I think uh, leadership as a profession, as, as a practice, um, I think is not well represented today. I, I think uh, it's woefully lacking in, in the way that people actually conduct themselves as leaders. And so I thought, you know, why not? I'll, I'll do it. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I took the time. I sat down. I, I tried to come up with things that people haven't heard me talk about before and talk about them in a way that uh, would be a little bit challenging, you know, not the typical literary fluff that you might see between the covers of a new business book, but something that would really challenge people to dig deep and, and examine and evaluate who they are and what they're doing on a daily basis. So that's kind of what drove it. Cool. Um, thanks for sharing that with us, Mike. Um, back to my question from the beginning. Are you the first leadership blogger ever? Holy smokes! I, you know, I might be old enough to claim that. I, <laughs> I, I would say uh, I started blogging. Oh, I think maybe 2002, 2003. Um, they weren't even really called blogs when I started. Um, they were called online diaries. But, uh, yeah, I've, I've been doing it a while. I don't know if I can claim to be first, but I've certainly been doing it for a long time. Okay. So, Mike, I know that your book outlines a bunch of different leadership hacks that you recommend, and I was wondering if you could tell us which one of those hacks is your favorite, or maybe explain a bit about the title while you do that. Yeah, I think uh, there's probably a slide up there right now that uh, gives my definition of hacking, and I, I, wanted, I, I wanted to look at leadership a little bit differently. And, you know, leadership hasn't changed a lot. Um, over the years, I mean, the basic core tenets of leadership are the same today as they've always been. But the problem is we live in a different world today than we did a decade ago, a century ago, several centuries ago. And so while the principles remain the same, the methods in which we must apply them to be successful have changed. And so what I wanted to do was go back and hack the time-tested principles uh, in a way that made them more relevant for today's world. So we're, we're not changing leadership, uh, but we're trying to make it a little bit more relevant and, and a little bit more effective. So you know, my definition of hacking, as you can read up there, is really kind of taking things that are, in, are complex uh, and, and trying to simplify them and be more creative with them. And, 
create some tricks and shortcuts and and work through the complexity to drive the innovation. And so I broke the book down into I think eleven chapters, and they're all my favorite um, for different reasons. But I, I, I guess if I had to pick one, I would probably say uh, hacking the future gap. Um, you know, innovation is something that all leaders really um, struggle with. It's what keeps them up at night a lot of times. They worry about becoming obsolete or irrelevant or, or having their, their personal brand or their organizational brand fall into the, to decline. And I, I think in today's world where leaders are pressed so hard to deliver short-term results, that they often kind of forget about the big picture. So uh, I spent a lot of time talking about what the future is and, and how to how to deal with innovation and how to deal with change and how to disrupt mediocrity. I mean, at its essence, I, I really believe that leadership exists to disrupt mediocrity. And, and so I, I spent a lot of time helping leaders understand where they should be spending their time and where the mountain movers are, not only in terms of today, but in terms of how to build a bridge to the future, or maybe put uh, more succinctly, how to pull the future forward. So I, I would say areas of future and innovation are, are really kind of passions of mine. Very cool, Mike. Um, so I have one question that came in about hacking itself. Uh, so John Smith says, hacking sounds like effective learning and teaching. And he's wondering if you can make some connections between learning and teaching and hacking. No, yeah, I, I think so. I think, you know, I, I'm a lifelong learner. I, you know, I, I think the, uh, I think uh, maybe it was John Maxwell who said, uh, leaders are learners, and I think uh, the minute you stop learning as a leader is the minute you should stop leading. And I think too many people in leadership positions uh, feel like they've arrived, and leadership isn't a destination, it's a continuum, it's, an, it's a journey. And any day that you wake up and don't learn something, you haven't been an effective leader, so education and learning are really, really important uh, for me, for my clients, uh, for for the people that I engage with, because it's how we get better. It's how we help others get better. So hacking is just kind of an insightful way uh, to teach, and you know that's what I do. I, I write, I teach, I speak, I advise on matters of leadership, innovation, and problem solving. So, you know, sometimes I'm educating, but more often than not, I'm being educated. I totally agree with that, Mike. Um, and here's another question along those lines that came in from Shane Hammonds. Uh, his comment is, Peter Drucker said, we spend a lot of time teaching leaders what to do. We don't spend enough time teaching leaders what to stop. Do you agree? Absolutely. Um, you know, we all carry baggage with us, you know, and, and I think... Uh, Baggage comes in a lot of different forms. There's emotional baggage, there's philosophical baggage, there's uh, experiential baggage, but the easiest way to get rid of baggage is just to put it down. And so I, I think, you know, we carry way too many things with us that deserve to be left behind. And, uh, you know, people have good habits and they have bad habits, and we need to replace the bad ones with the good ones. I'll, I'll share with you a uh, kind of a principle that I've used for a long time. I think the uh, most often overlooked and clearly the most undervalued aspect of learning and education is actually unlearning. You know, I, I think uh, we need to take a look at what we hold as, as truths and, and really gut check them and, and see if they really are true or we just want to believe that they're true. So, you know, I, I'm a big believer that uh, great leaders challenge everything, and mostly they challenge themselves, and they challenge their own thoughts, and, and they look for false truths held as real, and, and they try and unpack that stuff. And, and so a lot of what I do personally and what I do for my clients is, is help them understand that 
uh, maybe what they use to get them to a certain point isn't what's going to be effective in moving them forward. And there, we all have bad habits, right? So yeah, to the extent that you can stop doing things that are destructive and start doing things that are productive, that's exactly where you want to spend your time. That is very valuable time spent. So I'm curious, Mike, are there particular habits that you have to teach the clients that you're coaching to stop, you know, common themes or things that you return to again and again? You know, it, it's interesting. I, you know, what I do for a living is so highly matched. Uh, I, I work um, in a really interesting space. In fact, if you had to pick a career, if you had to choose a, a career, you'd have rocks in your head if you, if you selected what, what I chose to do for a living. I mean, you know, I, I work with really, really bright, smart people who are highly accomplished and, and try and convince them uh, that they need somebody to help them be better. You know, and it's, a, you know it, it, it's interesting. I think uh, oftentimes we look at leadership development as something you do on your way to a certain destination. As I mentioned earlier, you know, it's kind of a continuum thing. And so people tend to invest large amounts of time, money, and resources in their personal and professional development in the early stages of their career. Yet when they reach the C-suite or when they become a board member and the stakes are really high and they have the most to risk and, and they are and they're making big bets not only for, for themselves, but for their organizations and those whom they lead, you know, they don't spend as much time on development. And, I, and I've never understood that at all. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. But when they wake up to the fact that, hey, wait a minute, you know, I can, I can have a bigger impact today than I've ever been able to have. I can be a bigger influence than I've ever been able to do, and I can help others be that as well, then, you know, the, the juices start flowing again. Once, once you flip that switch and you get them to understand how much better they can become, then they'll do it. But specifically to answer your question, I don't think there are any real common threads that I see because uh, each CEO is kind of a unique individual that's traveled their own unique path and, you know, they've created a, a unique culture and they deal in a certain geography or vertical and so each client engagement is really highly nuanced and unique but but I'll tell you if there are some common things um, I, I would say um, I, I would say they fall into a couple of categories one understanding that control is something that they have to uh, become very comfortable in surrendering uh, you know one doesn't often one doesn't often use the word surrender in the same sentence that they do leadership, but I think leadership is really the art of intelligent surrender. It's not trying to control the floor, it's, it's giving the floor to others. Um, so getting them to understand that the less they control, the healthier their organization and their culture is going to be, that if they can drive complex uh, topics and decisions and subject matter to the edges of the enterprise so it's not all bottleneck at the top of the house. You know, that's a really good thing. Um, you know, so surrender is one, self-awareness is another. Uh, under, you know, they call, they call blind spots blind spots for a reason, right? We can't see them. Um, so becoming a little bit more self-aware. And then I, th I think the third thing is Remembering that a leader's job is to actually lead. You know, it's not to pontificate, it's not to lecture, it's not to, it's not to monologue, but it's to, to dialogue, it's to engage, it's to discuss, it's to debate, it's to deal with tough things in a highly engaged fashion. So not to become the sequestered leader, but to become the highly engaged leader. So I would say, you know, self-awareness, I, I would say, surrender, and I would say engagement. Those are probably the three things that I spend a lot of time helping folks with. Interesting. It seems like something that we can all benefit from. It's being a bit more aware of, of how we're leading. 
Um, I have a question that came in from Corey. Uh, Corey says, you often hear people born to be a leader. People are born to be a leader. For those of us who need coaching, how realistic is it to actually learn how to be a leader? And what is the best way to absorb leadership qualities and implement them? In short, why are you so great at leadership while most other people struggle? Okay, that's a uh, that's a really great question, Corey. Um, so well, there's a lot to unpack all, there. Yeah, there's a, it's probably at least a five-part question. But uh, I guess, first of all, I'll thank Corey for calling me a great leader. <laughs> I've been called worse. Um, you know, I, I don't know that I'm a great leader. I think I'm a student of leadership. And I, I've kind of learned the tricks of the trade over the years. And I, I think, uh, well, let's unpack that. I think I, I like that terminology, Becky. I, I think let's start with the born versus made argument. Uh, some refer to it as the great man theory. And uh, I, I will tell you that uh, we're all born with certain traits. Um, some of us have intrinsic leadership qualities uh, to a, a higher degree than others. So um, you see this often when people are young, right? We all saw them when we were going through school. The, the team captains, the class presidents, uh, you know, the, the people that were natural leaders seem to bubble up to the top. Well, what, once you get past school and you kind of get into the professional career and you get deeper in uh, to your professional life, what you'll find is, you know, natural leadership ability that isn't developed and refined um, becomes antiquated very, very quickly. And those people who rest on their laurels uh, don't usually end up with the types of careers that they could had they challenged themselves and, and had, they, had they recognized how much it is that they don't know rather than tried to, uh, you know, just depend on what they do know. So I, I guess from my perspective, um, Leaders are, are born to a degree, but mostly they're made. And, uh, you know, I, I'm a product of the military. I, I spent some time in the service. I, I come from a, a family who served for generations. And uh, I, I think one of the things that the military teaches you real quickly is how much you don't know about leadership and how much you have to learn and how much better you can become if you view it as a trade craft and you apply yourself. And so I think all of us can be better. And it's those of us who choose to become better, and more importantly, those of us who choose to help others become better that really develop as leaders. You know, if leadership is about me instead of we, if it's about self-service as opposed to service beyond self, um, when you get stuck in the wrong paradigms for the wrong reasons, uh, your growth as a leader will stall and probably just implode. But if you really focus on how to make others better, uh, that's that's the test of a great leader. You know, don't don't look at a leader's accomplishments. Look at the accomplishments of those whom they lead. So I, I would say we're we're all born with certain uh, leadership qualities, but it's really the ones that we develop that stand out. Well, that is really challenging, Mike, to be able to take the spotlight off of ourselves and onto others to see how we can help them develop. It's almost like I hear you say, Mike, that as you work on developing others, that's when you're going to grow yourself more. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I think you know, leadership isn't about the leader. It, it, it really never is. It, it's, a, you know, it's about the people. I, I, you know, I've often said uh, there is no platform without the people. The people build the platform you stand on. You know? And so if you don't pay attention to the people, um, you're going to be in a world of hurt. I, I've often said that uh, leaders not accountable to their people will eventually be held accountable by their people. So it's really important to focus on, on really building into people. I mean, Becky, let me ask you this question. Think, envision the best leader that you've ever been around. Do you have somebody in mind? Um, yes. Okay. I want everybody on the call to do that. Think, think of the leader that's most impacted your life in a positive way. And then I want you to think about why you're thinking about that person. And, and I will tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt, the answer for everybody should be 
because that person invested in you. They built into you. They, they saw your potential and, and they encouraged you and, and, and they made a huge investment in your life and that's why they come to mind. And that's how you want others to think of you someday. So, you know, if, if you just look at, at the positive examples in your own life and try and mirror those to others, that's the name of the leadership game right there. Very powerful. So, uh, Mike, before I get on some of the other questions from the callers, I'm wondering if you'll tell us who that person has been in your life. Oh, boy. You know, I've had so many mentors um, over the years that, uh, you know, I, I feel absolutely blessed to have had so many people invest in me and to give me second chances, to give me third chances, uh, you know, to see that, uh, you know, I'm not as dumb as I look. <laughs> so, you know, I, I just, uh, I, I'm blessed to be surrounded by, by a lot of people that build into me on a regular, on a very regular basis. But I'll tell you, the person that has meant the most to me in my life is my wife. Um, I've been married for almost 30 years, and she's put up with a lot in, in our life, and she's always been there to support me, to encourage me, uh, to give me strength when I needed it. And I will tell you that uh, I'm a big believer that there is no such thing as a self-made man or woman. Anybody, believe, anybody that believes they are a self-made leader is arrogant, naive, um, or disingenuous or all three. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you look at your success, Becky, or if anybody on the call looks at their success, they're successful because, all, because of all the people that helped them along the way. Um, you know, the, the people that played with them when they were young, the teachers that taught them in school, the professors that invested in them later in life, the employers that gave them a chance, the, the mentors that encouraged them, the coaches that, that gave of their time to them. I mean, we're, we're all the benefit. Uh, we're all the benefactors of, of people that have made investments. So I just, you know, I, I'm a big believer that we should make investments in others. It's the, what goes around comes around then. Absolutely. And going back to the question that we were unpacking together, uh, that caller had asked, you know, why are you so great at leadership while most other people struggle? And it seems like if any of us are good at anything, it's because of the support and mentors we've had along our journey. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of it, too, is just perspective. Um, when, when, you, when you stop shining the light on yourself and you shine it on other people, you know, it, 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 that's a better lens to use. And, and I'll tell you that, uh, you know, it takes a, a lot of courage to be a good leader because you have to work on tough things, not just the things that are easy to work on and that you want to work on, but you have to do it in, in somewhat of a humble fashion. I mean, you, you can't go around uh, pounding your chest and, and leading with bravado. Uh, you, you, you need to have kind of a quiet confidence about you and in and, and a manner that instills confidence in others. And so you accomplish a lot more uh, with kind of a, a quiet, confident, humble approach than you ever will with a bombastic, arrogant approach. That makes a lot of sense. All right, so we have a bunch more questions coming in. Here's one for you, Mike. Um, often heard you have to have led at a high level in order to coach leaders at that high level. What's more important, knowledge, experience, or ability? Yes, my my answer would be you need all three. You know, I, I don't I you know, and I don't mean to dodge the question. I, and in fact, I'm probably going to infuriate some infuriate some folks with my answer to this question. But I actually believe you do need to have led at a high level uh, to coach a CEO effectively. Now, you know, I tend to blur some definitions. So before I get people too riled up. Um, let me define what I do for a living. Um, I actually don't like the term coach. Um, you know, I think when used outside of the field of athletics, it's, it's probably overused and maybe even tainted to a certain degree. Um, but 
I, I view myself as my client's closest personal and professional advisor. And I sometimes coach, I sometimes mentor, I sometimes consult, I, I sometimes offer a shoulder to cry on. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's a blending of disciplines that I bring together um, because I feel that, you know, I've been a sitting CEO. And so I, I understand what these folks go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And I understand the amount of brain damage that they incur daily to try and really accomplish great outcomes for their organizations. And so, you know, to, to try and help somebody in that world, having not experienced it, I'm not going to say that you can't do it. I'm not even going to say that you shouldn't do it. But what I am going to say is that if you, if you really want to be advising somebody at that level, you need to be very, very careful um, and, and not take it lightly and, uh, and take it very, very seriously because I've, I've walked into a lot of engagements where I've had to clean up some messes um, from folks that haven't been diligent, rigorous practitioners and, and basically have, have, have created some problems that shouldn't have been created. So I, I would say experience matters, talent matters, ability matters. Um, but you need all of those things. And if you don't have them, I would encourage you to be really, really aggressive in your pursuit of acquiring whatever skills or abilities that you don't possess so that you have a better, more well-rounded toolkit. And if you're going to advise people without some of those things, be very transparent about it. You know what? I mean, don't don't pretend, don't play games. You know, if if you're missing something uh, that you think the client needs, be very very straightforward and say, hey, this is not what I do. This is not an area that I have competency in. However, we can backfill or I can bring it to the table. Right? But don't ever pretend to be something that you're not, because when you're coaching or advising somebody at a very high level, um, you're playing with people's lives. Uh, you know, you, you advise somebody impulsively or incorrectly, and, and it, it can be tragic. So I, I guess I would just say wh whatever level of skill and ability you bring to the table, make sure that you don't get out over your skis and make sure that the client understands what it is that you are bringing to the table and where your skills begin and end. I, I don't know if that was the, the right answer, but that's my answer. Got it. OK, uh, so going back to some earlier conversation about shining the spotlight on others, a question came in. Um, this person is wondering, based on your work with clients, Mike, how popular you see the servant leadership model being, and wondering if you have any thoughts on why or why not. You know, I, I think, uh, like most things, Becky, the, the pendulum swings, you know, and there have been points in time where servant leadership has been all the rage, and there have been points in time where people minimize it or trivialize it. They, they, they believe that uh, may, maybe it's a flawed model. Um, in my opinion, it's the only real model. It's the only real sustainable model for leadership. If, if as a leader you don't see yourself as serving those you lead, in my opinion, you're not leading. I, I, I don't know how you can profess to be a leader and, and not serve others. Um, it's what it's all about. I, you know, I'll, I'll go back to uh, I'll go back to the military analogy again. I mean, when, when I was in the service, my my troops ate before I ate. They slept before I slept. You know, they, they were attended to before I was attended to. I mean, that, that, that was my job. Um, in the corporate world, that was my job. In the professional services world, that's my job currently. I mean, my clients' needs come before mine. Um, they have to, or I'm not doing my job. And so I think the popularity of servant leadership today is actually um, on the uptick. Uh, I, I know that there are uh, some big proponents and, and very vocal evangelists uh, of that particular discipline. Uh, and if I have my way, uh, you know, I shout it from the rooftops every chance I get because I, I really think that 
a leader is ultimately modeling the behavior that, that they want to see from others. So if you don't model a certain behavior, you have no right to expect it from others. And, and so I don't see how you can have expectations of people when they're not afforded the same opportunity to have those same expectations of you. So I, I think it's on the rise again. I think it's a good thing. And I think leaders who don't view themselves as servant leaders, uh, they've, got some, they've, they've got some development work to do. Let's just put it like that. Okay. Well, speaking of development work, we have a question that came in. Um, and let's see. So as a developing leader, should we focus on our strengths, our weaknesses, or both? So there's another development question. Yeah, both. Both. Absolutely both. But here, here's the thing. Um, you know, there's some weaknesses that, while they're there, um, they may not be meaningful or, or they may not be impactful. So a, as an example, um, let, let's say that, that, that you're a, uh, a very high-level executive, a senior executive, and, and you've got uh, great administrative resources and support. Uh, at, at your beck and call. I mean, you, you have folks that uh, have great skills in those areas. Well, maybe uh, building out a slide deck isn't a particular skill of yours, uh, and you see it as a weakness, but is that a weakness that you really need to spend time on? Probably not. Um, now, there are other weaknesses. Let, let's say you're in an executive leadership position, but you're not a good communicator. Well, that's a weakness you better take care of real quickly or it, it will take care of you. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's a matter of understanding uh, how impactful uh, certain strengths and weaknesses are um, and play to your strengths uh, where you can and shore up your weaknesses where you need to. But don't spend a lot of time on things that don't move the needle. Um, I, I kind of refer to things as mountain movers. Um, if, if something can move a mountain, I spend a lot of time on that. Or if something keeps me from moving a mountain, I spend a lot of time on that. But beyond that, um, you know, things fall pretty far down the list pretty quickly. So I guess long story short, the answer is both. Just choose wisely. Yeah, I think that's really helpful, uh, the paradigm of the mountain mover. Uh, here's a question from Jay. Uh, Jay's asking, Mike, do you need different leadership skills today than when you first became a leader? Uh, I don't know that the skills are different, but how they're applied, um, that's what needs to be different. I mean, I, I'll just, you know, I'll date myself, you know, I'm, 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 moving rapidly towards uh, my, my sixth decade in life. And uh, I'll tell you, the world's changed a lot. Uh, e even in you know, the past 18 to 24 months, much less a decade or two or three ago. But you know, when I started out in business, we didn't really have computers, per se. Um, you know, we had we eventually got to the point where we had like gigantic word processors that, I mean, but you know, computers didn't exist, spreadsheets didn't exist. I mean, if you couldn't do math the old fashioned way, um, you were at a disadvantage. Uh, you know, I, I can remember as cell phones, as, as fax machines came online and cell phones came online and, you know, the internet, uh, you know, started moving out of the, the academic and government world and into the, public sector, right? I mean, as, as the world evolves and changes and technology evolves and changes, and you know, you have to adapt the way in which you use your leadership skills. So as an example, um, when I started out in business, it, business was a pretty local thing. And you know, if, if you did business on a national basis, um, you know, that, that was pretty remarkable on an international basis. Um, that, that was pretty remarkable. I mean, only very large enterprises competed globally, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Now, you can be a solopreneur working out of your home and be doing business all over the world. So if you don't use technology differently uh, and use technology to lead effectively, 
uh, if your communication skills are great one-on-one -on -one, but they're not great one-to-many and maybe you prefer a, a, a particular medium over being able to work cross-channel, cross-platform, or cross-medium, um, you know, your leadership is going to have some gaps. So, so I think, you know, things have changed radically over time and, and if you don't apply the principles that you have, your core principles, differently, you're going to become irrelevant. You're just going to be part of the noise out there. You're going to get lost in the shuffle and ultimately you're going to find that your leadership becomes obsolete because nobody's listening and nobody's paying attention. All right. Well, speaking of that, I had an interesting question come in, Mike. Uh, Corey wants to know if you tweet for yourself or if you have an assistant who tweets for you um, because he says that the tweets are always great reminders and most of them are spot on. You know, I, uh, I am old school when it comes to the stuff that I write. Um, I, I write my own material. I write my own books. I write my own columns. I tweet my own tweets. Um, I, I, there, I, I have nothing against ghostwriting, and I have nothing against uh, using uh, administrative support to, to do those types of things. I, I think it really is a, a personal preference. But when it comes to my material, um, the stuff you like, it's from me. And as much as I'd like to tell you the stuff that you don't like is from somebody else, it's from me as well. <laughs> Great honesty there. All right, so uh, here's an either or. Uh, do you think it's better to take a stretch role or stay in your niche? Love that question. Um, I think I think you can do both, and let me explain it. I, you know, I'm actually gonna I'm I'm gonna bifurcate this question a little bit and attack it a little bit differently. Um, first of all, I think it's very possible to stretch within your niche. Um, as, I, as I think I mentioned earlier on this call, leadership exists to disrupt mediocrity. And, and there's nothing more damaging to, to a leader than to become comfortable with the status quo. And a lot of times niche players, they, they kind of fall into that trap of being comfortable and they kind of fall into the trap of relying on what they know as opposed to looking for things that they don't know. And, and so I, I think you know, you can stretch within your niche. Now you can also stretch beyond your niche. And, and leadership is a game of stretching. Um, I, I think, I, I'm a big believer that if you apply your leadership skills properly, you know, stretching isn't as risky as people think it is. I mean, I, I, I like to, to share with folks that, you know, spend less time managing risk and more time managing opportunity. Um, you know, great things happen beyond the norm. You know, uh, the, the real leadership starts beyond the outcome. You know, stop thinking about what is, start thinking about what if. Um, stop looking at best practices, think about next practices. Look beyond the norm and that's where you're going to find the extraordinary. So I, I think if you don't stretch, you're not only cheating yourself, but you're cheating those you lead. Um, you know, because as you stretch, they stretch. As you grow, they grow. And, you know, your job is to get people to understand that they can be more than they think they can be. And if you don't believe that for yourself, how are you going to engender that confidence in those you lead? So I, I guess long story short, stretch within your niche and, and where it's prudent and, and where the opportunity exists to do great thing, things, stretch beyond your niche. Wow, that's awesome. There were a lot of one-liners in there that I wish I could have tweeted in an instant. Uh, some really great stuff. Um, so here's another question for you, Mike, not necessarily on the same topic. Uh, which, which past leaders are good examples to study to learn about leadership? So um, I don't know if this person is asking from history, but what past leaders would you use as, as people to study? You know, I have... I'm kind of a history buff. Um, I'm a military history buff. I'm just a straight political history buff. Uh, I'm a world history buff. So I, I think uh, one of the things that's, that's wrong in many people's leadership approach is that they don't have good perspective 
on world history, political history, business history, economic history. Um, it, 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 history gives you context, and so I, I've I've been um, very very diligent about going back to history and looking at, at great leaders because there there are tremendous things to learn from them. So as an example, I think uh, you know Winston Churchill gives you great insight on what it means to be courageous. Um, Ronald Reagan uh, could teach a lot about commitment. Uh, George Washington can teach you a lot about character. Abraham Lincoln can teach you about persistence. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, can teach you uh, so many things in so many areas. <laughs> it's not even funny. I think uh, you know. By the time I think Teddy Roosevelt was a teenager, he'd probably seen more of the world than many of us have today. And that's back when when things um, when it wasn't easy to travel. I mean, you, you go back to uh, our founders and framers and look at somebody like uh, John Adams or John Quincy uh, and look at how much of the world they had seen at, at very early ages in their life versus how many of us have, have, have failed to, to make an investment in, in learning beyond our own immediate comfort zones. But uh, yeah, I, I love leaders, and you can learn from them all, the bad ones as well. Um, you know, I'll throw out a name that's not politically correct and not popular, but you know, there's a lot to be learned from Adolf Hitler. Um, I don't think Adolf Hitler was a leader, but I think he was in a leadership position. And he did a lot of horrid, tragic, aberrant, uh, just I, I can't even come up with the right adjective for, for him. But I will tell you that watching a, a bad leader is just as beneficial as watching a good leader, if, if you know what you're looking for. So yeah, I, go, go back to the books. Uh, look at business leaders today. I mean, you could look at... Uh, the late Steve Jobs and find things to love and not love so much. Same thing with Bill Gates or Richard Branson or an Elon Musk or, I mean, you 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 pick the leader. There's something to be learned. So history can teach us as well as the present, but uh, you can only really maximize your ability to learn in the present when you truly understand the past. Indeed. Uh, so here's another question along those lines, and I'm curious also. The person is asking what are the top five books you would recommend, and I'm going to switch it up a little if I can um, and ask what the top five business or leadership books are that you'd recommend beyond your own, of course. Well, gee, that takes all the fun out of it. Um, <laughs> uh, let's let's assume that um, your book's on the list. Then what other five? <laughs> you know, I, I'm... I'm probably going to um, mess with some people on this one. Um, I, I think some of the best leadership books out there are the ones that most people probably haven't read. Um, and let me start with one that I don't like at all that most people highly regard, and, and I'll explain it, and then that'll set the tone for how, how we address the the rest of the question. Um, I would venture to say everybody on this call, if they haven't read it, they're familiar with a book called Good to Great um, by Jim Collins. Fair, fair assumption, Becky? Have you read it? Uh, it's on my shelf. I haven't read it. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say that most people um, highly regard that book, and, and I don't. And, and I'll tell you why. I, I think. Um, you know, that book was written in a vacuum studying, um, you know, very, very successful Fortune 500 companies. And, you know, Jim, Jim is a brilliant thinker. You know, he, he basically lives in a think tank and he does, he does a lot of great research and he pulls together a lot of great data. But I, I think there are some unfair assumptions uh, in, in that work that say, well, if a Fortune 500 company can apply this principle, so should you. Um, and I don't know that that's universally true, and I, I think it's actually kind of a dangerous thought. So I'll, I'll use one of the concepts in the book as an example. Um, 
you know, Jung believes that leaders, some leaders are more successful than others, and he ranks them on levels with a level five leader um, being the best leader, the leader that can take a company from good to great. And I think, uh, I think what you'll find is that, at least what I've found, is that there are certainly qualities possessed by level five leaders that are admirable qualities, but I'll tell you, a level five leader is not the only leader that can lead. Um, you know, leadership is about context, it's about timing, and certain qualities that we might find personally offensive in some situations might be the exact quality that's needed to move something forward at a given point in time. So, you know, there, there's a theory out there that, uh, oh, charismatic leaders, you know, they're overrated and that introverts can lead just as well. And I agree with that. But there are times where a charismatic leader will be more effective than an introverted leader, and there'll be times when an introverted leader are going to be more effective than charismatic leaders. So, you know, it's not really about your style or, or your makeup. It, it's about how you apply it given the context and the situation at hand. So that's kind of a long answer, but let me, let me get to the books. Um, I'll, I'll tell you one of my favorite books uh, is Lincoln on Leadership. I, I think it's a fantastic book. Um, anything by Warren Bennis is brilliant. Uh, Warren Bennis is, is, has become a friend of mine. He is, uh, He's an amazing man. He was the he was the youngest combat inf infantry officer in World War II. At 17, he was a lieutenant leading men into combat. Um, so you want to talk about baptism by fire? Uh, read something by Warren Bennis. He he actually founded the modern practice of leadership. The the actual discipline of leadership as a practice didn't exist before Warren Bennis. Um, so anything uh, from Warren Bennis is great. Uh, I'm a big Peter Drucker fan. Anything by Peter Drucker is great. You, if you want to read a book about a leader that uh, most people don't know a lot about but can learn great things from, uh, read Bonhoeffer by Eric Metaxas. Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a theologian uh, during World War II, and he came out, uh, you know, he was very much against uh, what Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich were trying to do and took a very public and vocal stand that ended up costing him his life. But when you believe in something so strongly that you're willing to sacrifice your life for others, you know, that's a pretty good testimony to leadership. Uh, Jim Strzok is kind of an interesting guy. Jim is a, he's a friend of mine as well. He wrote a book called Serve the Lead, and I'll throw that one out since we talked about servant leadership earlier. Uh, Jim, I, I think Serve the Lead is probably the best book on servant leadership in the market. Uh, and Jim knows a little bit about leadership. Uh, he's written books on Reagan and Roosevelt. Uh, he worked in uh, he worked in politics at the highest level. He served in the military at the highest level. Jim's a great guy. Um, you know, I, I like uh, I, I like oh boy, there's so many books out there. But uh, I think you can read books on uh, you know ancient Greeks like Alexander the Great, Cyrus the Great. Uh, you could read things on any of the founders like John Adams or George Washington. Um, there's just so many books out there you can't you can't distill it down into a list of five, or at least I can't. Got it. Someone's asking uh, the title of J Jim Strock's book. It's Serve to Lead. Is that correct? Correct. Serve to Lead. Okay. Uh, so someone's asking Mike if you're. Uh, considering a TED Talk about leadership, or maybe you've done one and we don't know it yet. I haven't. They, I, I actually received uh, one invitation and it didn't work with my schedule. Uh, it was a couple of years ago, but uh, you know, if 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 I could sync it up with my schedule and they gave me a second invitation, I'd probably do it. But uh, as of yet, there's nothing on the radar. Okay. Um, I have a question for you that's a little bit back to some of our earlier conversation. Uh, Mike, um, and this caller is wondering if you see the difference between training and development and what are the implications about that for HR and leaders in operations? Yeah, I, uh, I actually wrote a Forbes column on this, oh boy, I want to say about a year ago, and I think I included um, some constructs of that column in, in the new book, Hacking Leadership, because I think it's, a, it's important. 
Um, training and development are different disciplines completely, but they're often treated as one. And when it comes to leadership, you know, I don't think you train leaders. You develop leaders. Uh, training is 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 more about things, and development is more about people. Um, you know, training is more about function. Leadership or development is more about form. So I, I think when it comes to leaders, leaders don't want to be trained. In fact, if you have a training session and you try and invite leadership people to training sessions, good luck in finding bums and seats because you're not going to get them there. They'll do everything within their power to avoid it. Give them a development session, they'll, they'll gladly show up because they want to develop. So training is something that plays a role, um, but it usually plays a role at lower entry level types of things when you're trying to build um, a discipline or you're trying to indoctrinate somebody in terms of a process or a procedure or a function. But when it comes to leadership, development's the name of the game. So um, some HR folks get this really, really well. I'll tell you one of the best uh, chief human resources officers that I've ever seen. His name is Tim Huval. Uh, he, he's the CHRO at Humana, which is a client of mine. And Tim absolutely gets development at every level. And not just for the quote unquote high potentials, the top two, 300 people in the organization, but he gets development down to the entry level. And he's he institutionalizes development as part of the cultural ethos as a framework of, of what Humana believes and how they operate. So when you get somebody that really understands development, not only is it more effective for leaders, but uh, it's more effective organizationally and culturally. So training has its place, but uh, it's been elevated beyond where it should be elevated to, if that makes sense. It does indeed. Okay, here's a controversial question. It might be the toughest one of the hour. Mike, are you ready? Okay. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, so Tess says that she's noticing that you referenced a lot of books that men have written and that you're referencing the male leaders in history. And so she's wondering what female women leaders from the past you admire. And then she mentions books written by Meg Wheatley and wonders if there are some books by women that you would recommend. You know, I uh, let's, let's do the whole diversity thing because I get criticized a lot for that. And, and I'll, I'll share with you that... Uh, I'm a huge believer in diversity. Um, you know, I I think it's important, and I think uh, and I think we are underserved uh, as a nation and frankly a, a, as a planet um, by not having greater diversity. That said, you know, diversity shouldn't be a mandate. I, I mean, leadership is about recognizing talent and ability and being blind to issues of gender or issues of ethnicity or issues of sexual preference. I mean, pick your, pick your classification. I, I think when leaders focus on the best person for a job, um, as opposed to qualifying that by looking for something beyond that, um, that's where we get into trouble. So I, I don't want the best diversity candidate. I want the best candidate. And, and I don't really care whether they're male, female, old, young, um, you know, what, what race they come from, what their preferences may or may not be. I care that they're the best person for the job. And so that, that's my global overarching statement on diversity. Um, secondly, I often get criticized with regard to um, folks that uh, folks that I tend to work with, and I I, I want to make it real clear that you know I work mostly with Fortune 500 CEOs and their boards, and if you take a look at the number of women that happen to be Fortune 500 CEOs, well, there are not a lot of them, and only one of them is a client of mine. So, you know, I don't, I don't have a natural universe there. Now, I'm the first one to say that I wish there were more Fortune 500 CEO women, uh, and, and I think there will be. Um, in fact, the uh, lady that leads our executive search practice, Patricia Lunkoff, 
is probably one of the leaders nationally on pushing for uh, women on boards. Uh, you know, she's she's very focused on that area, and and I think to the betterment of our clients. So, long story short, I'm a big believer in diversity when it's done right. When it comes to actual uh, female leaders, I, you know, I'd like to give a uh, URL to people real quickly. Um, we did a project here at NT Growth not too long ago. Um, and actually, I'm going to try and find the URL. It's a, we did a kind of a live curated timeline called the History of Leadership. And, and, and these were mostly my selections. Uh, some, of, some of my staff contributed as well. But we, we went back thousands of years in history and picked out who we thought the best leaders were and summarized them. And so we put this live on the web. And you're going to find all kinds of women on this uh, timeline. And it's for a reason. They deserve to be there. But uh, the URL is n2growth.com, so that's our corporate website. The letter N, the number two, the word growth, G-R-O-W-T-H dot com, slash history hyphen leadership. And so it's n2growth.com slash history hyphen leadership. And you'll find a timeline there. And you're going to find all kinds of women on that timeline. I, I'll, I'll tell you. I think the best example uh, of a female leader on the face of the planet right now, I'm, I'm, act, I'm actually quite taken with her. Um, it's a 16-year-old it's a Pakistani girl, and her name is Malala. And I don't know if any of you have heard of her or seen her speak or watched her um, conduct herself, but uh, she was very outspoken against the Taliban. Uh, and, and was on a bus one day, and Taliban boarded the bus and and shot her um, several times. Uh, you know, w at least one or two rounds, I think, probably uh, above the shoulder and the neck and the face. Uh, you know, I don't have the exact count, but you know, she almost lost her life. But she believes so strongly in women's rights that in a culture like Pakistan, and as a young woman, she was willing to be vocal. As a young woman, was willing to be vocal and outspoken. It almost cost her her life, and she almost won the Nobel the Nobel Prize this year. In fact, I think she should have won, and I was frustrated that she didn't. But if you have a chance, go online and Google her and watch her talk. And she is the absolute definition of leadership. If you can watch her speak for. 5, 10, 15 minutes and and not have a wet eye, I, I'd be shocked. She's absolutely brilliant. But, uh, you know, in the corporate space, uh, Indra Nui is great. Uh, yeah, Pepsi, uh, Jenny Rametti is great at IBM. Uh, I, I, I think I heard you mention Meg Whitman. Uh, she does a great job. I mean, they're... they're I'm not a big Marissa Mara fan, but uh, you know there there are a lot of there are a lot of of women out there that do a great job of leadership. We just need more of. Got it. Well, I think that we're just about out of time. We're at the end of the hour together, and I want to thank everyone for participating for the excellent questions. And Mike, I'm going to let you wrap up with one more thing. If there's something you want people to know that you haven't had a chance to say yet about your work or your book or your take on leadership. Uh, this is your chance. We have two minutes left. You know, I, I'd encourage you to buy the book if, if, if you're interested in reading a, about leadership, because I think you're going to find some things in there that you won't find in other business books. Uh, I, I think uh, a lot of the books out there today are regurgitated material. Um, you know, it's the same thing that's been said over and over again with a little bit of a, di of, of a different twist. I mean, you know, this isn't a leadership fable. Um, you know, it's it's based on my years of experience in the trenches. It's got live case studies. It talks about uh, some of the leaders today and and what they're doing and how it makes a difference. So it's a good read. Um, I'd encourage you to to pick it up when it comes out uh, for the holiday season. I think it'd make a great gift, and and I appreciate any support that you could give in in that regard. And mostly, I just Thank you for being a part of this today. I, like I said initially, I truly value the fact that somebody would sit around for an hour and listen to me flap my lips. So thank you very much for that. Thank you so much, Mike, for joining us today. Have a great day. We'll be in touch with uh, the recording in case you want to listen again. And 
also, um, we will send those links, uh, the one that Mike mentioned on N2Growth and the link to the book when we follow up via email. So thanks so much. Have a great day.